Hi, everybody. Today, I am joined by Andy Mansfield, who is an osteopath and a tutor. So I'm really excited to be talking to him about all things classical osteopathy, what he did before he got into the profession, and where he thinks it's going next. So welcome, Andy. Hi, nice to be here. Yeah, thank you. And I'm really, and I genuinely am really excited to talk to you because I remember when, so the re, how we met is you're a tutor at BCom. Yes, I started and, as, a, as a standby tutor. And then I became a little bit more permanent when you were in the third and fourth year. So. Exactly. And to the point where I pretty much stalked you for an entire summer. Yes. So, and it was more that I just wanted to learn the way you, you thought because it was so different to uh, what we had been exposed to and really challenging at the same time. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, it's not the first time I've heard that. Uh, I had uh, a different background to coming to the BCom. Uh, and the BCom has always had a fantastic reputation and it was a privilege to work there, really amazing. Um, because when I graduated, it was still the BCNO, the British College of Naturopathy and Osteopathy. And I knew a lot of BCNO graduates. Uh, and if you really look at the history of the European school where I trained, uh, a lot of the British College of Naturopathy and Osteopathic, kind of the, a lot of the graduates had come to the ESO to try and form uh, a new school uh, and really kind of put their tilt on things as well. So I, I was looking forward to working there and, and it was a great opportunity. Yeah, because you had had a previous career before coming into the profession. Yeah, I was in the Navy for eight years. Um, I was a, wasn't entirely sure what I wanted to do for a living. Uh, I had an idea, I fancied being a physiotherapist, but I'm someone who's quite physical. I need to do something physical for a living. And I think in a very structural way, in a very physical way. Um, and I went to a very old fashioned Northern Grammar School, which to their credit uh, did me proud, but actually was probably not the best style of education for me. So I, um, uh, I left after only doing a year of A-levels and, and uh, then realized that I needed a job. So I ended up joining the Navy and doing their engineering apprenticeship. Uh, and that was the best thing I could have done at the age of 16, 17. Um, and after eight years in the Navy, I had a really good idea of who I was and where I wanted to be, and what I was good at. Uh, and I had a much more holistic view on things. It's only in hindsight, I look back now and I kind of realise that the, the way the Navy trained you as a marine engineer was that you thought about the whole ship, the ship as a whole in, in one go. Yes, you were learning individual systems. It might be diesels, it might be fridges, it might be hydraulics or, or whatever. But you're growing the, the, an understanding of the ship as a whole. When one bit of equipment falls over, the whole ship suffers. Uh, and it's only in hindsight now that I kind of look back and go, well, I came into osteopathy uh, with that in mind, um, I really picked osteopathy because uh, I had an interest in the sort of physical therapy. Uh, it was that or speech therapy, something like that when I was at the Navy. There was a short list of jobs I wanted to do, uh, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, and uh, it was something, sort of like something along the lines of a physical therapy. And I figured, well, I was an engineer. I had a structural understanding of things. I wanted to do something physical. Uh, and osteopathy seemed to be just a little bit more mechanical uh, than physiotherapy, as I understood it at the time. So I didn't realize it was going to be quite so philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> Neither did I until I think I started learning from you. And so one of the things that I wasn't quite aware of was the rich history behind osteopathy and how philosophical it actually is. It is, uh, it is a philosophy. Andrew Taylor still said, and I actually use the terms that osteopathy is a philosophy. It's a way of understanding the world around you. Uh, and that kind of really resonated with me because it's something that can really permeate, permeate your life. It can really kind of get in and really kind of, when you look out the window, you can start to see the principles of osteopathy in action. Um, so the structure governs function. Well, I'm an engineer, so I'm going to say that there's something, uh, it looks the way it is because of the way it has to work. And as a diesel's engineer, that's kind of makes so much more sense. There's nothing, there's no frippery. There's no spare bits on a diesel engine. It looks that way because it's got to do a job and it does it very well. So that kind of thing re resonated with me. So uh, yes, it, osteopathy is a philosophy. Uh, these are a, a, a set of principles that we can really figure stuff out. And I think the way I trained in the Navy was also 
that you were faced with problems that perhaps no one had seen before. Uh, and it was because things were integrated and coordinated on board a ship, uh, you were always working as part of a team, so communication was key, but you were always working for the best outcome. Uh, and that wouldn't necessarily be something that you would find in a manual or find in a, a log book or that somebody had done before. You were just trying to figure out things uh, as you went along. And it was actually uh, a quote from Johnny Parsons, um, figure out what you're trying to achieve and then figure out how you're going to achieve it. That's very much the kind of the European school way of doing things as I was, as I trained, so as I went through. Yeah, and so you went to the European School of Osteopathy down in Kent. Yeah. And what was that like? Um, what was the training there like for you? Uh, it was ideal for me. I think coming out of the armed forces, I might have suited at one or two of the other schools, maybe even the BCom, or partic particularly at the time, what was the BSO is now the UCO. Uh, because it's BCO, uh, BSO has this kind of reputation for being quite structural uh, in the way that they do things. And I, I know an awful lot of BSO graduates. I'm inspired by an awful lot of BSO graduates, as are you. Uh, if we're going to mention uh, Lazarus, genius what a man to, to learn from um, a real inspiration uh, so the differences between the schools i think is a real strength of the profession uh, and the eso had a very more very much more global uh, approach uh, where everything was a bit more kind of inclusive everyone was a little bit more uh, versatile right from the word go literally the first week of the first term we were trying to palpate the cranial rhythm completely over my head uh, really kind of didn't get it at all for a good six months before I even started to believe in in any kind of cranial sort of thing coming from a spanners and hammers fitters and turner fitter and turner kind of way of going about things uh, it wasn't really something that I it took a while for me to kind of figure things out and I think when you're doing cranial and more functional uh, things and practice, practices like that, you've got to kind of apparently, this is how it was taught to me, you've got to look at the tissues as if you're looking out the corner of your eye. Now I'd come out of the armed forces. I was either thinking about one thing or I was thinking about another thing and I could absolute focus on everything that I was doing. Uh, and then uh, to kind of look at something as if you were just, paying attention but not really trying to be involved uh, I really struggled with that so it was a good whole 12 months of, even into the second year before I started to kind of really engage with that uh, that way of working but that was really a, a, an expression of the ESO you had visceral you had uh, cranial you had IVM you had all these kind of different things from all the way through the first second third and fourth year it's not something you kind of learn as an adult in the fourth year it really developed and it shaped your structural way of doing things as well uh, the sensitivity and the palpation that comes with that kind of engagement with the body actually really kind of informs your mechanical approach your uh, ideas as well so that was a big influence i was going to say because we were introduced to, to to cranial osteopathy at the end pretty much in our fourth year and for us it was almost learning a whole new language yeah and so i can't imagine how different it would have been to have that threaded through right from the beginning it is right the way through. Uh, it is threaded is, it, is the right uh, way to describe it. Uh, you engage the body, that palpatory contact you have when you're doing something as basic and as structural as from the outside, I'm going to get onto the GOT, the classical approach in a minute. And you're engaging the body in a very mechanical way uh, by putting your hands on. You're listening with your hands all the time. So you're palpating and practicing at the same time, diagnosing and practicing and uh, diagnosing and treating at the same time. They just, they come together. Uh, and then that feeds into that kind of holistic contact with the body because you're diagnosing and treating and responding to what the body's doing as you work through. Yeah. And so you mentioned the GOT for anyone who's listening or watching that doesn't know what the GOT is. Can you tell me a bit more about that? The GOT originated with John Martin Little John who um, I'm going to upset people by saying he wasn't a terribly uh, nice man. I don't think he was terribly, he was broadly respected, uh, but you know, I think he was a difficult man to get on with. Uh, I, he uh, fell out with people in Kirksville and ended up in, uh, in Chicago and fell out with people in Chicago and then came over to the UK. He actually founded the BSO, the British School of Osteopathy. The irony being is that he doesn't, that they don't teach any of his stuff before. And, and you mentioned Little John to most BSA graduates and they kind of go, oh, him, who? Um, and it was really the lineage, when I was at the, B, at the ESO, 
uh, the lineage was still alive coming through uh, through there. So the classical osteopaths were really based in Maidstone long before the ESO got there. And that's because John Wernham, who was a student of John Martin Littlejohn, who had, was a student of Andrew Taylor still, uh, had a practice, had a, a school in, um, in Maidstone. And when Tom Dummer really was kind of starting to develop the ESO, the origin of the ESO was essentially renting rooms from John Wernham. Uh, there may be people who will come in and correct me and give me more detail on that, but I'm going to try and keep it as basic as possible so that I don't get involved in politics and, and so on. Um, so the Wernham was still alive when I was um, in at the ESO, and additionally there were other people who uh, had trained at Wernham School, and when Wernham School in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s had failed to get accreditation just for a year or two, they came over to the ESO and some of them went to the BSO, some of them even came to the BCom. Um, and they were uh, amongst my closest friends and they were a big influence on the way that I worked. And they'd had an extra year just doing classical osteopathy, Wernham, Wernham, Little John, Little John, all the way, right the way through. And they were a big influence on the way that I work. Um, and then when I first graduated, uh, there was uh, Richard, I went to work for Richard, who had worked in a practice that was a very classically orientated practice as well. So I saw the real benefits of it. But GOT is the general osteopathic technique, general osteopathic treatment. Uh, it's often known as the body adjustment, but I would actually, I, I like to kind of draw a different difference between them. GOT is the routine uh, of where you put your hands and what levers that you use and you, the the actual practical application of it. The body adjustment is how you adapt that to the individual patient in front of you and how you turn it into a, a system of medicine or an address of that body in order to uh, engage different tissues and different systems and to influence the body in a much bigger, more holistic, more global way or engagement, a bigger, uh, bigger engagement of the body. Does that make sense? Yeah, and this this feels like a like a a learning experience for me. This is great. Um, and so, how would the GOT system differ from sort of a, a clinical examination, for example, that we were exposed to at BCom, for example? So you'd still have the observation. You would still have uh, active movement testing. You still have the practice, the, the passive movement testing. You still got palpation. That all still exists in there. But the GOT has a, a routine which makes it a framework upon which you can layer other things. So from the ESO perspective, where you've got the cranial, you've got the IBM, you've got BLT engagement with the joints as well. You can work in a very stimulatory way, or you can work in quite an inhibitory way, depending on what each tissue needs and which each segment needs. You can work segmentally and you can work globally. So there's a, it's a multi-system, multi-level engagement of, that, of each body. And therefore it's relevant to the patient in front of you. It's not something that you wheel out of a box uh, where some, a patient comes in with a particular pattern and you go, well, that, I have a treatment for that. It's page seven of my catalog and I, should, and I just apply that. Each time the patient comes in, each patient is different, but we're in the business of making a change. So, uh, the GOT routine is a framework upon which we can we we can go back and be consistent so that we don't miss anything and we engage the whole body all the time. So it's a little action at each level, uh, at each spinal level or each in each joint. So you don't miss anything. The routine means that you don't miss anything. And then that adds up to a much bigger picture. So you're influencing the whole body all the time. But you can apply it segmentally and you can apply it globally. You can apply it in a stimulatory way or you can apply it in a, an inhibitory way. And I think that's really important because often, at least when I was training, I always thought about stimulating the body and, and activating something. And rarely, not, not rarely, but sometimes you don't really think about inhibiting systems or tissue. And yeah. so that's a really important thing to remember. It's something that, that uh, it is, you're absolutely right, it is kind of fundamental to the way that I was trained. It's fundamental to remember when you put your hands on, the body's ready to change. The body doesn't know how not to be healthy. It wants to, uh, to be healthy all the time. Um, it, 
it's if you're throwing up symptoms the body's throwing up symptoms it's to tell you that where the problem is so you're diagnosing based on symptomatology case history is a big factor in in a particular classical osteopathy but osteopathy generally what happened to you what brought it on what's your history and it could be 20 30 years ago but it's changed the way your body works and you've adapted to it and you've compensated for it so um when we're when we're working with that sort of way of thinking is there may be segments that are actually really really buzzy and doing all the work because there are other segments that aren't working very well at all mechanically it might be that they're restricted but also there's stasis and stuckness and the classical kind of dis-ease lack of ease leading to disease uh, which we've all been exposed to as osteopath as well so we're trying to free up mechanical mobility but also fluidic mobility, neurological mobility, so the freedom of balance of uh, the nervous system, whether it be central and peripheral, or whether it be autonomic as well. So that's where you engage the body on multiple levels. With the training at the ESO, you're engaging through fascia as well, because the BLT and the viscera and the IVM way of working is that you're engaging into the cranial rhythm through the fascia. Cranial is a bit of a misnomer. You can do it on knees and elbows because it's the same stuff, palpatory, palpatory wise, um, as uh, as working through fascia and fascial unwinding, and, and it's the same engagement with the body, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, that's a personal engagement with the body. Yeah, and what I really enjoyed about listening to you talk when I was a student was just how your approach was you almost, like you said, listen to the body. So each type of tissue had a different rhythm yeah. or a different feel to it. And I had never been exposed to that previously in, yeah. in that kind of way. Well, palpation is quite, is probably what osteopaths do best. It's what we really train for. And uh, palpation is, is the core of osteopathy. How does we figure out what's going on in front of this, in front of us and how has their history brought us to, to see us for brought them to see us um and so you've got to be able to feel your way through and obviously bone feels different to muscle feels different to connective tissue well let's make use of that let's engage that so let's feel the quality of those tissues what's what's the boniness of bone what is the musculariness of muscle what does fascia feel like and what does it feel like in healthy people and that will allow me to identify what it feels like when it's not healthy. And the big advantage that we've got as osteopaths is we're in four years with our hands on each other. And hopefully at least we're relatively young, fit and healthy while we're training. So we get a chance to kind of really put our hands on young, fit and healthy, give or take. And then when, when we let loose on real people in third and fourth year, uh, those lesions become a little bit more obvious a little bit more accessible because we're finding true lesions it doesn't mean you haven't found any lesions but it's kind of pushed you forwards and challenged you in the first and second year when you really haven't had your hands on anyone with significant lesions again give or take um, because everyone's reasonably young fit and healthy does that make sense yeah absolutely and i think we were quite lucky in my year because we had students of varying different ages and varying different fitness abilities and 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 injuries absolutely i mean i broke multiple things during my time at bcom i had like three fractures i think i broke my thumb in the third year i think it's i think everyone should go through that so yeah yeah maybe not <laughs> oh, i broke yeah i broke both my fingers playing volleyball yeah and so when you do something like that and that your hands are almost taken away from you, albeit briefly, what do you fall back on? Where, where do you go? <laughs> that's a really, really, that's an excellent question. And I think, again, in hindsight, breaking my first met, uh, I smashed it doing Aikido. I, someone threw me and I landed all wrong. It was, all in, it was entirely my fault. Um, I think at that five or six weeks, I was in a cast and I couldn't treat. I was observing in clinic for the same amount of hours, so you know, keeping my hours in clinic up and, and sitting there in the third year, watching other people do it. It's a bit like a game show. When you're sitting at home, it's easy, okay? When you're sitting there watching people do it, you're gonna go, I don't like that. Uh, that doesn't work for me. And then you would see somebody else, you'd observe somebody else, you go, oh, that resonates. I really like that, I'm gonna steal that. And I think that five or six weeks there where I couldn't, work in the third year i couldn't put my hands on people it really gave me a chance to kind of sit and sit back and reassess and figure out what i was thinking and what worked for me 
and it changed the way that I started to work as well. I also spent a lot of time, very much as you did, uh, hanging out with the, the clinic tutors, because if I'm not taking case histories, I'm not kind of uh, able to uh, treat the patients. Who else do you spend time with? In the BCOM, you spend time in the departure lounge. Uh, I, I, would, I would hang out and, and speak to clinic tutors. I would shadow them and follow them around. And it's interesting that kind of watching them work was actually kind of a big influence on the way that I, I came, I turned out as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so were there any sort of influential factors or tutors that really sort of shaped the way you either saw things or the way you treated or the, just the way you thought about um, patients in front of you? I think I was very lucky. Uh, there was a, a, I think there was a sweet spot at the ESO where we had uh, some of the old and bold osteopaths who had been in practice 30 years, 40 years, and, and, other, so, you know, and, and that kind of depth of experience. I mean, again, Wernham was still alive and we were kind of trying to ring him out. We didn't spend a lot of time with him. Uh, but one of my a really good friend of mine lived in the flat at the back of his college, so we spent a lot of time with him. Um, and she was one of uh, Wernham's school, originally at the Wernham school. And so she had a really good understanding of him and the way he worked and kind of it came in with us as well. It came in with the rest of the class. So we were trying to bring him out. We did have some, you know, go have some lectures with him. And we spent some time with him. I had a treatment from him, there were several treatments from him as well. And it just, that kind of depth of experience uh, when a man's been in practice for 70 years, or when there's, you've got Peter, people like Peter Bargrave, who, whose father was an osteopath, and he'd been in practice for 30 or 40 years, and you've got Jez Lamb and Harold Clark, and all these, uh, these are names I know you probably haven't heard, um, but they were very much a, a big influence on, the, on founding the ESO in the 70s as well, so a big influence on the way the ESO worked in the 70s. Um, Robert Lever as well, and then Sue Turner, they were just amazing people that really kind of influenced me so I think there was I was very lucky to be at the ESO at that time where there was just this number of people who had been in in, in the profession for years and they just brought this kind of real gravitas and depth of experience there but then you had kind of although he'd been in practice a while um, John Parsons, Nick Master they were kind of a bit more of the younger and Nick, um, Nick Tongi was a really big influence uh, Colin Gregory was a big influence as well, um, and um, I've got to give Devon Regendron uh, a big up as well. He was uh, a big influence for me in clinic. Um, so there were people. It was just I kind of stole from everybody. I'm a bit of a kind of a hoarder like that, a bit of a ferret. When he helps me, I thought, oh, I'm a bit of a magpie, and I stole all the best bits from from other people. And I would listen to what they were saying and try and read between the lines as well. So what I came away from people like John Parsons with well think about what you're trying to achieve then think about how you're going to achieve it don't wheel out the catalogue for this patient or this pattern and that's very much i think when you're in third and fourth year what you want you're going well i think i've diagnosed the disc on this patient how do i treat it and the question was well, what does this patient need what does this body need uh, not uh, page six uh, and, and apply what you what you think you need. you've got to kind of uh, be driven by the patient and driven by the body in front of you and their history and so on and so on. Yeah, and that's one thing that I find that I struggle with, not just because of COVID and lockdown and everything, but you know, you're seeing patients back to back often if you're if you're lucky and busy enough. Yeah. And you can at least for me, I can lose that perspective sometimes. And you you get tired, you fall back on sort of techniques that you know are just going to work, just going to get you through the day, yes. not put a lot of stress on your own body because let's yes. be honest, it's physical. Yes, and you can I can get some a bit complacent sometimes. I'm not going to lie. I think you're absolutely right. When you've got to plug away, you've got to figure something out. You do end up working in a more intuitive way. Uh, as long as you're working from that perspective of like, what does this patient need? And you treat what you find. And that's perhaps why your palpation skills, your observation skills, your practical testing skills have to be, uh, you know, that, that's what you have to prioritize. Then you find what you need to treat and you work in that much more intuitive way. Um, because and you always do your best work when you're busy anyway, because you're not overthinking things. You're just getting on with it. So where do you get that from? Where do you get that renewal, I suppose, of, of energy or just perspective? Um, I like 
I, it appears I like quoting other people. Russell White is an osteopath, had a practice in, has practice in Shrewsbury, if he's still out. Uh, and he used to say, uh, you've got to do something. So the patient is coming to you and they're in trouble. They need help. You've got to do something. Uh, so you can't not, you, you can't over, you can't panic, you can't overthink, you can't gonna go, oh, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that. And you can't avoid engaging with that body. So you have to get involved and you've got to do something. It doesn't matter what you do, more as much as it matters of you doing something. And again, that body wants to change, that body wants uh, help, it wants influence. And a lot of the time, I think what we're doing is we're, we're providing a fulcrum around which the body can figure itself out. Um, and that's why I like the, the GOT, the body adjustment, those words aren't going to do it justice. Okay. Uh, but that classical way of working is that you're treating this patient in front of you based on the basic principles. Now, the basic principles that you and I were taught um, actually came about in 1953. Um, they were long, they were, came about long after Andrew Taylor still um, was gone. And I think sort of post-war osteopathy was still trying to figure itself out. So it was chiropractic and a lot of other uh, professions as well, still trying to figure itself out. And it was um, the American Academy of Osteopathy, again, don't test me on that. Um, they were trying to figure out the identity of the profession. What is it we do? What can we tell the world about where we come from? And they took a bunch of quotes from Andrew Taylor Still and they kind of refined them down and it came to the body is a unit, uh, the body is a self-healing mechanism, life, is, life finds a way, uh, the rule of the artery is supreme, which I'll come back to, and then structure governs function. And over the last sort of few years, a few decades, since 1953, then structure, function, reciprocity is probably a little bit better way of putting it. Structure, function in relationship, a better way of putting it. So that's anatomy and physiology. Uh, one. Um, the rule of the artery supreme is probably the hardest one to grasp, but when you get it, that's what really is one of the, uh, the abiding factors in how you go back to treating holistically or globally engaging that body. If it doesn't matter whether you're a cell, whether you're a liver, whether you're an organ or person or a town, nutrition, drainage and communication all happen through arterial systems. In, city, in the case of cities, it might be a river. Uh, in the case of towns, it might be roads. Um, but in the body, it's uh, arterial venous uh, system. So that's nutrition, drainage and communication are the optimum for health. OK, so you've got uh, fresh nutrients, drainage of toxins and then communication gives you purpose. Okay, cells will adapt what they're doing depending on the cells next to them. If you inject a stem cell into a tissue, it will become a cell of that tissue. So they're stimu we're, we're stimulated by the stuff around us all the time. Communication is key. So that's really kind of a, one of the fundamental aspects of it. If you bear that in mind, that freedom of uh, fluidic exchange and uh, nutritional exchange, uh, neurological freedom as well, then you're, you're allowing the body to figure itself out. You're freeing up those mechanisms that the body is wanting, because the body is a cell beta mechanism, wanting to use to get better. Does that make sense? And we're doing it through the structure and function relationship by moving the body around in a mechanical way, but we're, we cannot not engage all the tissues in the body when we move the body. The whole body is listening and ready to learn, ready to move, ready to change. And we have to think that way. We've got to be able to, we can be very specific. If we find something that's stuck, we can just free it up. But it, pay attention to the big picture while you're doing that. Because it could be something simple. <clears throat> it could be something simple, uh, such as the patient had a big party last night and they're a bit hungover. So you might want to avoid the liver, for example. Um, if they've had open heart surgery, you know it's going to refer, uh, they're going to be restricted through their rib because they've got a cracked chest. It's going to affect the back as well because of the way the ribs attached to the spine. How's that going to affect their autonomic nervous system? How's that going to affect the lymphatic drainage? Because where's the cisterna chile? Where's the sympathetic nervous system? These are all just, just trying to think in three dimensions. I was the kid that grew up with Lego. Uh, so three dimensional kind of structural stuff is, it was basic for me. But thinking in three dimensions is really kind of fundamental to, to how we practice as a profession now, and what we do as individual practitioners. Yeah, and one thing you, you just mentioned earlier was that, you know, the body wants to move, the body needs to move, and it, it yeah. heals itself through movement. Yeah. What are your thoughts on, like, on couch-based interventions versus, you know, more active or loading-based type interventions? Okay, 
uh, I'm, I didn't train to prescribe stretches, exercises, or anything like that. Um, quoting Andrew Taylor still, find it, fix it, leave it alone. Um, John Martin Little John said, let your patients live their lives, just be there to help them along the way. Okay, so you, th that way of thinking is that we, uh, we intervene in order to allow the body to heal itself. We can be lifestyle consultants, absolutely. I consider myself to be a, a lifestyle consultant as much as anything else. That's what osteopathy is. We can do that, we can give them advice, but let your patients live their lives, just be there to help them along the way. You can give them advice that is probably not so great to be drinking two liters of Diet Coke every day. You might want to try it. And your, your background as a naturopath uh, will kind of be a bit more informed in that regard. So I didn't have that kind of that, that training of being able to prescribe exercises, to be to prescribe stretches. Your background in Pilates is stronger than mine. Well, I don't have one. Um, I'm married to a yogi. Uh, so I understand that, that kind of engagement, but yeah, stretching exercises, my background's in martial arts as well. So uh, stretches and exercising is part of, of that. And it's not something I trained to do at the ESO. So it was about intervening and then getting out of the way. Um, and the, it's really, even the word intervention uh, is, quite, is a little bit too strong. We are guiding the body. We're releasing the restrictions to the normal flow of it. it sounds like such a cliche when you say that. But I think it's something that we need to be saying to ourselves and to other people continuously, because I forget that. And I'm sure other people have to the point where, I mean, I'm, I work predominantly, I am working in the NHS and, and there's this expectation that, you know, you treat, you give exercises and the patient leaves. Yeah. And sometimes there's this dichotomy of, well, actually you're not, I, I'm, I'm not a rehab specialist or I'm not a personal trainer. Like, yeah everything I prescribe is Pilates based because that's, that's what I train in. That's what I know. You make best use of your, your expertise, whatever that expertise may be, you make best use of it. That's what we, we, yes, that's what we should be doing. Yeah. And so then how do you manage patient expectations where they might expect a certain treatment modality and you're like, well, actually this is what I think your body is telling me it needs, or this is what my expertise. And so this is how I go about things. Yeah. Managing patient uh, expectations is about justifying everything that you do, uh, being able to justify everything that you say. So I found this, this ties in with that bit of your case history, I think that make, makes more sense. And that's probably why this is more restricted. That in turn is having an effect elsewhere in your body and that's what we're going to have to engage in perhaps the longer term. So the short term is get the patient out of pain. And the longer term is how am I going to uh, engage this body how am I going to allow this body to not slip back into a, a compensatory pattern particularly if it's been there for 10 15 years how can I prevent that how can I treat the entire package uh, to uh, optimize uh, that patient's recovery and, and continued recovery and there's an element of management to it as well maintenance uh, is what we call it where we may be seeing patients every three to six months or whatever and I've seen patients in fact I'm coming back I'll pick up Pilates here not a practitioner, but I've had a number of patients who would come and see me in my practice in Yorkshire uh, every three to six months for a bit of a checkup and a tune up. And I can think of three of them who actually rang me up and said, I've been doing Pilates twice a week. I don't need to come and see you anymore. And I, well, that's fine. That's You're fine. welcome. I'll take your mortgage any day. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's another thing, especially like um, that I've been reading about and just, you know, watching people on, on Instagram and Facebook and how they, you know, they go very much down a advertising route of, you know, MOT your body. And then you have a whole sort of other side of it is actually, you just see me when you see me. Yes. Um, I think we, we are trained, we are expected to have respect for other professionals. Uh, and I think it's a really much, as I'm watching uh, third and fourth years graduate now, as I was uh, examining phobias the other day, um, the, the, it's part of that OPS, the Osteopathic Practice Standards, that we are expected to understand and, and work alongside other practitioners. So you working in the NHS, you're working alongside physiotherapists and you're working alongside uh, you know, occupational therapists, I've no doubt as well. They're the unsung heroes, fantastic. There are certain things that the physiotherapists are trained to do that, I personally, although you know, more modern osteopaths are perhaps trained to do as well, uh, I wasn't trained to, to prescribe exercises. That's what physios do really well. And I think it can work really complementary uh, to osteopathy when you've got personal trainers, you've got physiotherapists, and you've got osteopaths who are perhaps more of the interventionists, and then you've got them more sort of, well, here's, a, here's how we manage your lifestyle change. 
and here's how we're going to perhaps get you fitter and that working as part of a team and then working things together and i mean that's my dream practice uh, the practice i work at in uh, in st james is is uh, is a health club and uh, we, i work alongside the physiotherapists and i work alongside the yoga teachers the pilates teachers and the, and the physical the personal trainers i it's my dream job honestly i love where i work it's fantastic yeah and especially when i was working in mental health you had that multidisciplinary approach Absolutely, but yeah. i don't always see that or i suppose generally you don't always see that in the osteopathic industry because everyone tends to work on their own in their own clinic very i don't know if I, i'll probably get in trouble now this is your influence but very much secluded from each other we are it's, it's a very isolating profession um in fact uh, one of the things i ask if i'm recruiting a um a new associate is where do you have a support network around you um it's right that if, if we're thinking about um psychotherapists psychotherapists have to have something called supervision uh, they don't go into practice without checking in with uh, their supervisor their therapist on a regular basis so you've got to know what's your excuse my language crap and you've got to know what's the patient's crap and the more sorted you have those kind of two elements the much more you can offer a patient the much more grounded you are much more of a fulcrum you can be for their unwinding their resolution um, and i think it is a very isolating profession we work on our own face to face one to one i'm not i still wouldn't call myself a people person but i'm okay as a person person i'm good at the one to one <laughs> although here i am lecturing you know, I'm teaching 30 odd people at a time, so I'm fine. Um, but it, we, it is very isolating. We do work as a one to one on a regular basis. So you, that patient becomes your focus. And then after half an hour, 40 minutes, you get another one. Um, so you've got to be able to switch and stay grounded. You've got to be able to stay mobile and grounded at the same time. And that's not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to do. Having a network around you, whether it be just friends, uh, but a professional uh, network around you is the best thing you can do as a practitioner is and I think this is what you're doing with this channel uh, is encouraging people to kind of really get kind of engage with people who work outside their own profession and see what other people do and what other professions have got to offer and just learn from each other because I think emotionally we're not taught on and I can only vouch for my course but I don't know how it, how it differs on, on your course we're not taught how to emotionally ground ourselves we're not taught how to emotionally deal with patients crap let's be honest um because although i mean i have a background in mental health and psychology and that's my first degree and and suddenly at become there's two years of it but we're not taught how to deal with people essentially because that's what we do day in day out indeed we're not we're not taught that um my uh, i suppose my background in the forces had a big influence on, on that uh, about being grounded but i also think the big benefit uh, that i in my experience at the eso the european school of osteopathy is that when you're practicing in a really functional way from the word go the first thing you've got to learn is be grounded and even in when you're when we're learning the got the the general osteopathic technique we've got to use our body weight to do that so we've got to be centered. We've got to be over our feet and balance, off balance. The last thing that patient needs is more of your stuff. Okay. And that even mechanically, you know, if they're in pain and you're doing a side lying technique or something like that, and your body weight is on them, that's imposing yourself on them. Mechanically, yes. Maybe even spiritually and uh, in other realms as well. That's not what we should be doing. We should be helping them respond uh, and helping them unwind their own their crap the last thing they need is more of our stuff and that's often the, most patients uh, the last thing they need is more input uh, to, to be some and particularly in modern society everything's sort of really stressed and we're in the middle of a pandemic there's an awful lot of stressed people out there the last thing they need is for that experience of uh, of the treatment to be a stressful experience so how are you going to go about engaging that person as a person and not impose yourself on them and not give them more crap to deal with yeah, and, and it, it's not easy it's not easy yeah and it comes back to what you're talking about earlier you know inhibiting systems and and working within that multidisciplinary approach because i also I often feel especially not just patients with chronic um um presentations i mean regardless of acute or chronic but typically 
patients with chronic issues who've been dealing with these things for years, I'm like, why aren't you seeing a talking therapist? Why aren't you, you know, working on that level as well because we all think oh I'll just go see a doctor I'll go see an osteopath or a physiotherapist yeah. but nobody's thinking oh I should go to see a therapist of whatever mm -hmm. modality you believe in prescribe in yeah we it, don't often do that it's it's getting better it's definitely getting better um but mental health still has a stigma about it um telling someone you go see a therapist you're either well they either think you're posh or you must be mental it must be bad. And actually, no, I think um, the recent wars in Afghanistan and, and Iraq and the combat stress, I'm, I'm, ex I'm a veteran anyway, I didn't get shot at at any point, but I'm, I'm a veteran. So the, the, the idea of post-traumatic stress disorder is much more re prevalent nowadays. Uh, and the idea that going through a stressful event or events or a process and like that can influence you in a much more deeper physiological way as well as a, a, a psychological way. And then we're kind of starting to get this idea through that, that I think the general public are getting the idea that psychology and physiology are completely related. Well, osteopathy has been saying that for 140 years. Uh, so you, you, the patient inhabits their body. They are through and of their body, but they're not necessarily in their body solely they are their body is them and they are their body um, yeah that's an, a, kind of a, a fundamental principle of structure function relationship in osteopathy yeah and something you talked about earlier about the the got technique um if someone for example hasn't been to the so hasn't been embedded in that right from the beginning of their training what would you recommend they do to maybe learn a bit more about it. Not that they have to, not that everyone has to use it, but just to be exposed to it, to see, is this something that would suit me and suit my practice down the line or not? Yeah. Well, John Wyndham's college still exists. Uh, it's not 104 Tunbridge Road, that's the ESO clinic, but it's on Tunbridge Road in Maidstone, 90, don't look it up. The John Wernham Classic, uh, John Wernham College of Classical Osteopathy, JWCCO, uh, they may have changed their name recently uh, to step away from him, but uh, the, the, their college, the college still exists, they still teach, uh, it may be called the Institute of Classical Osteopathy now, mm -hmm. um, and you can do a postgraduate course there which will really kind of introduce you to the ideas and certainly bring you back to the technique if you've never been exposed to that engage, that way of engaging with the body. Um, but it's being able to use the routine. If you saw Wernham working, um, then from the outside, it looks very much the same. Uh, he may be treating, treating two or three patients, and I'm, I'm gonna do this tomorrow with uh, down at the ESO for the international department. I've got two patients to see, and I will try and do the same, you know, try to do, do something different on each patient, but the routine will be the same so that you don't miss anything. But your intention within that technique changes depending on whether you're trying to traction through so as to influence the diaphragm uh, to balance the pelvis or whatever on a mechanical level, or whether you want to work into the viscera, uh, whether you want to influence the autonomic nervous system, perhaps inhibit the sympathetic nervous system, perhaps stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. It's having an idea of what you want to achieve on that multiple level way of working. Um, and the, I think if you're looking for that sort of thing, postgraduate, the Institute of Classical Osteopathy still exists and um, you can do a postgraduate course with them. So it is still there. It is still alive. Um, it is um, very much a British thing, um, but it's still very much kind of enjoyed throughout Europe. Um, it's a, a strange, there's a British identity to osteopathy and I think the ESO still has a little bit more of a connection to the European way of doing things. And that's part of the history of osteopathy in the, the, when little John came over, having fallen out with everybody in Chicago. Um, there were other osteopaths who came from Kirksville and Chicago as well, who went to Europe and influenced osteopathy in Europe. So the British way of doing things was already different. Uh, it's part of being on an island. Um, but it was already different back in the history of sort of 1917 when the BSO was, uh, was founded. And so why do you think that classical approach is very specific to the ESO where it isn't necessarily run through at BCOM or the UCO or, or other schools, LSO? Um, it, the, uh, my wife trained at the LSO 
and it's definitely there. She was influenced by the, the GOT and was aware of what the GOT was. She was, and I think that the strength of the LSO in that regard is that they're very good at poaching uh, tutors from other colleges. Uh, so it's a mix, of, real mix of BSO, BSNO, and ESO colleges and other you know, influences as well, College of Osterpass and so on. So the, the LSO is a real kind of mix. So you do get it, if you, but then if you're training and you're training there part-time, you get to pick and choose relatively who you want to, uh, to 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 hang out with and, and be influenced by um, I don't know about the BSO the BSO is very much it seems to me the voice of osteopathy in the UK um, and the ESO has a little bit more of a kind of reputation for being a little bit more holistic a little bit more global and BCNO has a real depth of history the B BCOM has a real depth of history as well um, and long may it remain so very much uh, through Stanley Leaf and the naturopaths and uh, all that kind of history that, that comes together. Naturopathy and osteopathy work together so well um, that they, you know, they really ring together. And I think one without the other at uh, the BCOM would really be a, would really kind of destroy the identity of the BCOM. The, the, the two need to be together. So long may it remain so. Why does classical osteopathy still at the ESO? Um, I can only vouch for my history there. Uh, and that is that because the two schools are in Maidstone, there was an awful lot of interaction. And you've got to remember that Tom Dummer, who founded the ESO, uh, rented rooms in, with, with Wernham. And they were, they were definitely colleagues. Uh, they had a very deep mutual respect for each other, even though Tom Dummer and John Wernham effectively take two different approaches. I can talk about a specific adjustment technique and, re and bring you back and say, well, actually, they're the same thing, but um, that's for perhaps another day. <laughs> um, but I think that Worm's influence was there because Tom Dummer had died in 99, 98, 99, just before I got there. And his influence was still very much there. And there were students of, of um, uh, Tom Dummer who were teaching there. But because Wernham was still around as well, I mean, he was in his 90s when I was training, it was in his early 90s. So we, I think there was a real kind of element of trying to ring him out. Uh, and there was a real recognition of that lineage as well. So we've got Wernham and we've got access to him. He was trained with and by J.M. Littlejohn, who was trained and, and with and by Andrew Taylor still. So that, that's a real kind of tight lineage uh, over the course of 140 years. Um, that really, really we ought to make uh, um, the best use of. Through that, there was there were more than one. There was more than one um, tutor or teacher of mine, lecturer of mine, uh, who were very much kind of Wernham orientated. And when we were taught, it was very much the GOT was the real kind of fundamental basic. This is how you get started in osteopathy. If you're stuck for something to do you know that you've got a routine to fall back on. You've got something that you can put your hands on, you can engage with this body uh, in front of you and you can influence this body in front of you. You can be influenced by it in the sense that you can change the way you want to work. You can you know, figure out your intention, but the basic structure of, your, of what you're going to do each time a patient comes in is there already. And that was a, that's a real benefit, a real bonus, because this, I think without that, there's a real sense of you can go, well, what do I do now? So a patient comes into you and presents and they, you take a case history, but then you kind of go, well, figuring out how I'm going to change this body is really tricky if you don't have uh, a treatment plan. And the GOT just gives you this basic treatment plan. You can put your hands on, be involved with what's going on. So Wernham died in, 19, in, in 2007 at the age of 99. So it was in his early 90s when I was training and we were trying to ring him out then and get as much as we could out of them so wow that's amazing and he was still practicing until about two or three months before he died wow. at the end, 99 yeah <clears throat> legend so yeah. yeah on another level but and you mentioned that you know you've you've lectured at um, bcom you lecture now at eso yeah. what are the things that you're seeing coming up with you know current students or new graduates that you'd like them to just be more mindful of or? There's a, I think there's a tendency within the profession um, and it's influenced by the fact that we are now a, a, a recognized and, and registered profession. Um, there's, an, there's an element of 
needing to be recognized for what we do and therefore having to base what we do on evidence and that can guide us away from the basic principles and the history of osteopathy so my advice to new graduates is don't dismiss uh, the ideas of Andrew Day still because it's just one one bloke or J.M. Milton because it's just another bloke or and it tends to be blokes or there are you know, Charlotte Weaver and there are some old and bold osteophants who aren't just blokes um, they've got a lot to say and they, their ideas are valuable and there's a tendency I think to be training our younger osteopaths to come out as I want to use the term posh physios uh, because they're being trained to, to prescribe stretches and exercises and perhaps we're diminishing that global engagement with the body and perhaps we're not training them to think as osteopathy as a system of medicine uh, and I, so I would say that go back and explore what the old school osteopaths were doing. And I'm talking McConnell and Teal from 1906. Um, yeah, the, the, it's called the practice, of, the practice of Osteopathy. It's on my shelf somewhere. Um, and it's got uh, how we were treating typhoid and cholera and infectious diseases like influenza and so on. And it, it's a, like a Merck manual for osteopaths. And it was there. And yeah, we, we might argue, well, yes, but it's just anecdotal because it's one person or it's, it's just two people. But they were writing this down. And to quote Adam Savage, the only difference between science and dicking about is writing it down. If we write it down, we make it a legal document or we, can, we make it evidence. Uh, so we, it, when we're talking about making our practice more evidence-based, which I'm for, is absolutely we need to uh, be more mindful of the evidence behind what we do but I think we need to be a little bit more flexible when it comes to what we call evidence uh, for what we do. It, osteopathy is never going to fit a randomized controlled double blind trial like you might find in pharmaceutical medicine. Um, we need to find other ways of research uh, and there are some very good people doing some very good stuff uh, trying to figure out how we can research what we do and how we can gather evidence for what we do but we can also realize that our own time in practice i've been in practice 17 years if i go back and i look at some notes that i wrote 10 years ago and i learn something from them that's me working on, on evidence uh, so evidence-based practice evidence informed practice for that because that's why i prefer to call it uh, it isn't necessarily about doing things as far as research is concerned and there's good reasons for that the funding isn't there for one <laughs> We're trying to get funding for osteopathic research is very difficult and there's also a tendency when we're thinking about evidence-based practice to think that if there isn't evidence for it then there is negative evidence so a lack of evidence is not evidence against something it just means someone hasn't done the research or you haven't looked for the research in the right place so I think what I was saying to the younger graduates and new graduates and more modern osteopaths is to don't dismiss the philosophy, don't dismiss the principles, because ultimately you're going to be faced with a patient and have to figure out what you're going to do. And all you need to do is fall back on those basic principles. Body's a unit. The body's a self-healing mechanism. The rule of the artery is supreme. Figure out what that means to you. And structure function relationship. And if you're uh, influenced by the, in, the Institute of Classical Osteopathy or you're in, interested in it, then there's another 10 principles which you can uh, use within the DOT to just literally to apply those four basic principles of osteopathy. Uh, and then you're applying the, the, the philosophy of osteopathy. I feel like that would take up like a whole other podcast just to go through all those 10, but that'd be amazing to do maybe in the future. Uh, well, we could do that. I've just been through them today because, um, <laughs> <laughs> because I might be using them tomorrow. <laughs> And so one of the things I found particularly um, helpful when, when, you were, when I was um, learning from you, um, well, I'm always learning from you, but when you're tutoring, is your approach to your differentials or your diagnosis. And I just want to go through that quickly with you because selfishly I forget sometimes, but I thought if I found it that sort of eye-opening, I'm sure other people would. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, yeah. There's, um, within uh, modern pharmaceutical and surgical medicine um, if you're going to cut someone open or you're going to prescribe something you need clarity of diagnosis and what that come what tends to come about is then we need a, a definition of what you have 
We need a label, and for one of the phrase, we need a label to stick on it. Um, and that way of thinking isn't really compatible with osteopathy when you're looking at patients as individuals. Uh, so when patients come in and they say, my GP says I've got sciatica, we go, mm, that's interesting. What's causing the sciatica? Uh, that way of thinking, because sciatica just means pain down the back of the leg. It doesn't tell me anything about what's causing it. There could be a number of different reasons you've got pain down the back of your leg. What sort of pain is it? What happens when you move? Uh, there's so many different influences. This is why case history uh, is so big in osteopathy. So you think of like sciatica as a description of the symptoms um and that's a diagnosis and so many of our modern diagnosis modern not i'm not blaming modern medicine i'm not but our modern society uh is to stick a label on something that's it you have this um and that's unfortunate because it can reinforce uh for some people uh a their diagnosis can become a crux it can be it can start to define them if, if they're not careful and social media is really good at making that a really big deal that's a really a real problem um, and so there's a tendency to describe the symptoms and put the word syndrome on the end um, so irritable bowel syndrome chronic fatigue syndrome uh, and so on those are really good examples they're functional syndromes by definition, not very well understood by med modern medicine. Not medically unexplained symptoms is another, another way of describing them. But as osteopaths, we have a responsibility to look a bit deeper, to say, hold on, but what are ca what's causing these symptoms? What's the relationship? Where's the anatomy and physiology? Where is it breaking down? And the body's expressing that breakdown through those symptomatology, through those symptoms. So how do we engage with that body in order to reduce that breakdown uh, in order to influence the symptoms so we're not necessarily distracted by the symptoms so that would be my way of thinking is be very careful about just labels um, so putting a label on something is not a diagnosis that said if we're going to communicate with other professions uh, like GPs and orthopedic surgeons and physiotherapists we've got to be able to share well, we've got to have a shared communication so we need a diagnosis and what we tend to do as osteopaths, the way I was trained, uh, is that we think of oh, tissues causing pain. Where does it hurt? What has brought this patient to see me today? So why does it hurt? So that's your predisposing factors. And then why isn't it getting better on its own? Osteopathy is based on the idea that the body is a self healing mechanism. Why isn't it getting better on its own? So that's the kind of the, the maintaining factors. So the three levels, an osteopathic diagnosis has three levels to it. Tissues causing pain, predisposing factors and maintaining factors. So you've got, uh, for example, um, a lumbar sacral junction strain. I'm going to keep it simple and I'm going to keep it osteopathic. A lumbar sacral junction strain uh, uh, because the man fell out of a tree and it's maintained by the fact he's in his 40s and he hasn't stopped work because he's self-employed. So that's why he's not getting better. He hasn't given a chance to rest and recover and so on, respond and allow his body to respond to the injury. So how are we going to go about that, addressing that? And it then takes a much bigger picture uh, engagement with the body in order to influence that, that example. Does that make sense? The tissues causing pain, predisposing factors, maintaining factors. Where does it hurt? Why does it hurt? And why isn't it getting better on its own? Those are the questions we're going to be asking ourselves. And that's going to allow us to figure out what we want to achieve and then how we're going to achieve it. Yeah. And I think I was just listening because for the pure joy of that, because I remember my last day of clinic where we got signed off. I mean, yeah, it was the last day I wanted to get the heck out and my diagnosis was l spine spondylosis. And you looked at it cause I, I needed you to sign off on it. And you looked and you're like, well, what, what is that? What, what are you doing? And I thought, shoot, you're the wrong person to sign that off. <laughs> So that's not to say L-spine spondylosis isn't a problem. Uh, it's not to say it's not the diagnosis. Right? This is definitely, and this is like, if someone cut the video off, and then I'm going to get into trouble. So this is the important bit. <laughs> Listen. Like, L-spine spondylosis exists. It does cause problems for people. Absolutely. However, there are people out there who are not patients. There are people out there with spondylosis in their lumbar spine who are pain-free. So why, where's the breakdown in this patient? Yes, they could be diagnosed with 
L spine spondylosis, lumbar spine spondylosis, and that is the tissues causing pain. And that may even be their predisposing factor and their maintaining factor. But have you looked bigger than the label? That's it. And so, uh, yeah, I was, I was probably the wrong person to come in and sign off on a simple diagnosis like that. And I was like, but what? But what? And maybe I, that I'm that six year old kid. But why? But why? Um, yeah, and I'll never grow out of that. As an osteopath, you should never grow out of just questioning why. Challenge everything, quest, question everything, uh, even your own assumptions. And that way they get reinforced. They get kind of uh, the ones that work and the ones that resonate will stick and you just get to re, re, reinvent yourself over and over again if you rediscover new stuff all the time and you never get bored that way and you learn something new from every patient and i'm pretty sure Wernham in his 90s would have told you that he learned something new from every patient and never get bored You'll, it's a fabulous profession it's just the best place to be uh, and we get to make our own decisions and those decisions are justified and based on, on those basic principles and philosophy of osteopathy yeah. And that's the one thing that really came across whenever you were in lecture or, or in clinic is, is the passion behind it. And you were in clinic and you were never shy about us asking why and asking repeatedly because you've probably gone through that diagnosis modality or way of thinking a hundred million times, especially with me. And every time I'm like, okay, one more time and pretend I'm a five-year-old. And, and that's what really came across when you were teaching is that passion. Cause when you're in clinic, you were, you were, you, it was hard work. We, we weren't easy. Let's be honest. Like, no. we, I mean, oh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> but you know, you, you had to sweat, you were sweating. In it clinic. shouldn't be easy. None of this should be easy. I'm in practice. I've been in practice a, a long time, longer than I care to realize. And the, I'm challenged every single day by by my patients and i still dread seeing new patients i see a new patient on my list and i go oh, what am i going to do what i don't know i have to I have to wait until the patient turns up but that if you ever feel safe in this profession you're not doing it properly if you ever feel like you're not able to reflect and change and adapt what you do and really kind of grow as a profession as a professional uh, you're not doing it properly uh, it's an art as much as it is a, a science i would argue it's more of an art than a science and we have to suffer for our art that's how we grow that's how we develop that's how we paint pictures that's how we create things that's how we act from the heart that's how we act from an intuitive way of practice um, and yes it has to be based on logic and rationality and principle and anatomy and physiology it has to be based on that kind of science um, but the, what you do is up to you in the practice. What you do with the individual patient has to be up to you and that individual patient. It has to be influenced by that patient in front of you. You can't rest on your laurels. You can't sit back and say, I figured it all out. Okay? And if, if you ever get bored as an osteopath, the next patient through the door will come in and kick your ass. It's just, that's the way it is. Yeah. Uh, it, that's, so yeah you if you want to be passionate about something it's an ideal thing to be passionate about and you're think, hopefully making the world a better place yeah i think we found the title of of of, of your new book the art of osteopathy oh, oh no that's already been done shoot can, yeah, be a sequel? can we do a sequel no. <laughs> I think so, even done zen and the art of osteopathy i think but it's that there's yeah there's a lot of books out there yeah, I've got most of them on the shelf. <laughs> and I remember you taking me to the library, literally dragging me to the library, <laughs> picking up books, read this, read this, read this. Well, and I'm not going to lie, at the time I was like, oh, this is great. And holy crap, where am I going to get the time to read this? Because the nature of the course is such that you don't have time because mm. it's so intense and it's fast paced and you have to keep moving because you've got another vibe in a couple of weeks. And you just, I mean, a lot of the times I did it to survive. Yeah. But it's after graduating that I've sat down and I have some of the books that I borrowed for the library, thankfully, before lockdown happened. So I still have them. And you can just read them at your leisure and just absorb what you can, you know, and, and just sit with it rather than just learn to memorize stuff. My, my driving instructor was a big influence. And this seems a bit off the being track, but bear with me. My driving instructor was a big influence on the way that I grew up. And so I, I just passed my test just before I joined the Navy. And 
uh, him, his voice in my head got me through the 16 weeks of basic training uh, because I just didn't want to let him down. Uh, but he had such an influence on, on the way that I think. Uh, and in hindsight, you kind of go, well, that's a really Zen statement. So he'd say stuff like, well, when you're a learner, you're not allowed to make mistakes. And you're like, what? And he said, yeah, now you've got to get it right now. You've got to be focused on what you're doing now. So you have to narrow what you're doing and be sure about what you're doing. After you've passed your test, you can do what you want. And that's exactly it. The day you pass your test, the day you graduate from the BCom and the ESO, the BSO, wherever you graduate from, and this goes not just for osteopathy, the day you pass out, the, the, the day you graduate, that's the day you start to learn osteopathy. Uh, and that, you, you've got to have some passion and you've got to be reassured by that. Uh, what a fun place to be uh, and it's not always going to be fun it's going to be hard it's going to be horrible as some of it's going to be you take you to some deep and sordid places that you, you've got to figure stuff your own stuff out uh, in order to um, to not influence certain patients um, to not be influenced by them but also not to impose yourself on them it's all it's a journey it's a meditative process as much as it is it's a journey of self-discovery as much as it is uh, a practice and, and making the world a better place. Yeah. And so where do you see the osteopathic profession going in the next five or 10 years? I hope, I hope we rediscover or we, I hope we gain more recognition for some of the history of osteopathy. I'm very lucky at the moment that I'm actually in my dream job. I am back at the ESO teaching principles and concepts of osteopathy. Touch wood, long may it last. You'll have to prize me out of there. So I get to hopefully give back what I got when I was in the first and second year and third and fourth year. Uh, at the moment I'm teaching first and second years. Um, but I've done some clinic tutoring there. I've been a clinic tutor for yourself. I'll get there and get to my point in a minute. I hopefully I can influence people to get half of what I did. If people can graduate from any osteopathic college with half of the passion that I had um, and feel privileged to have been influenced by uh, some of the people who wrote the books on the, the shelves behind me, the, that, that's my job done. And I, I hope that that gives the profession a brighter future. Um, I think it's very, important that we don't lose sight of who we are as practitioners and as a profession. Um, it, we're unfortunate in some ways that we are a regulated profession. We are fortunate in a lot of ways that we're a regulated profession. It isn't an ideal situation, but it's better than not being regulated. The problem perhaps that we have is that the regulation is perhaps heavy handed. Um, I would argue maybe even overfunded. And uh, there's an element of being seen to be doing something uh, and the OPS is fixing that the, the, the current OPS is actually making things a lot better and the only kind of counter to that is either the osteopathic colleges or the Institute of Osteopathy what was the BOA and they're paid for by members and therefore by nature underfunded and not as influential as they, they could be so I think we need, I personally, this is my personal hope that we have some kind of college, a central college or a royal college, um, if it could happen, uh, where the, is a centre of, it's just a centre of excellence for the profession and it isn't driven by the students, it isn't driven by the money that students generate, it isn't driven by politics, it isn't driven by anything other than just excellence within a profession of osteopathy. And there are no stupid questions. There are no stupid ideas. It just comes together as a, that would be my hope. Yeah. Don't ask me where I think it's actually going. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can listen to this to start off with. <laughs> but on that note, um, thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed just listening to you again because you do pick up on things even if you've heard the same thing again and again and I will listen back to this podcast every so often and another thought will come into my head that I hadn't considered before so I'm I, I feel very fortunate to have been exposed to such different tutors at VCOM and ones that I can still send an email and being hey so I've got this patient what do I do yeah well, I, it depends entirely on the patient would be my first response. <laughs>
minutes, fall back on the basic principles. Uh, I'm going to say thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, and I was very especially because uh, I haven't really taught much over lockdown and it's given me a chance to kind of get my eye in and uh, to start thinking about the principles and concepts of osteopathy ready to go back to teaching the, uh, this month and in a couple of weeks time so perfect uh, timing so where can people month. find you either on social media or in practice or uh, i'm a complete technophobe um so i'm not very good at keeping my uh, uh, my website and my social media up to date um i'm andy man osteo uh, on at twitter uh, i'm not on facebook um don't get me started good for you um, <laughs> I think my website is Andy Mansfield. I think my website is Andy Mansfield.com. Could be Andy Mansfield.co.uk. Um, I'll yeah. link it down below. I think, yeah, I'll send you the link. I'll make sure it's the right one as well. I'll send it to you. Um, but other than that, I'm on LinkedIn as well. Um, it's, uh, those are kind of my main sort of work social media uh, profiles. But yeah. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Andy. Thank you. Thanks for looking after me. Um.